one of the big feature requests that we've had for App Inventor over the years has been real-time collaboration. It's the second most requested feature, as far as I'm aware, after support for iOS. So, uh, <laughs> um, but since it's an educational tool, teachers are really interested in having students work together to build applications and to understand that building software is not just an individual task, but it's a task that many people work on together, right? Um, you know, the Blockly team has six people working on it. We've got uh, three developers working on App Inventor. And of course, people are putting in pull requests on GitHub and all these other things. So it's not just a task anymore of a single person sits on a computer and writes some software. It's really a collaborative effort. So how can we enable programming uh, in a collaborative way with Blockly? And I'm going to be talking about it from the App Inventor perspective because Obviously, we implemented it in App Inventor, but um, we're hoping that we can kind of kick off the stuff that we've learned um, to the Blockly team so that we can have it so that anybody can build a real-time version of an app with, with Blockly. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to some real-time collaboration models and architectures. Um, it's a little bit more on the technical side, but uh, gives some good background. I'll talk about how we implemented RTC for App Inventor. And then uh, we did a short user study, and we have some preliminary results of that. Uh, but we're hoping to kind of expand on what we've learned uh, to make a more sophisticated system. So um, as I mentioned, we already have many programs using App Inventor to teach coding. Uh, in the previous talk, I mentioned uh, Technovation as one. Uh, but there's First Code Academy uh, and many others around the world where uh, people use App Inventor to teach young folks about how to build apps. Um, as I said, it's already a pretty complicated activity, any of us know. Uh, so it's useful to be able to do this in a real-time way. So how do we get that into App Inventor? So there are really kind of two ways you can look at collaborative models uh, in the programming world. So the first is called operational transforms. It's been around since the late 80s. Uh, and the idea is that you have some centralized server somewhere in the world where clients are connected to. Uh, they send up their transaction saying, you know, my client did X, Y, Z. Uh, the server has to acknowledge that. And one of the things it does is it orders the operations and determines how to move from one operation to the next to try to preserve some form of semantics for the app that tends to be application specific. Um, and so this is kind of the approach you see in Google Docs. If you open up your network tab in the dev tools, you can actually see as you're making changes, the message is going back and forth with the server. It basically just sits there, opens up a connection, says, hey, is there any, anything different, anything different? Uh, and then if somebody else makes a change, it sends you that change and it gets applied locally so that you can see that change. Uh, the other nice benefit about this is that your server can act as the ground truth for your system. And so it kind of knows you know, the whole state such that if a new client joins, they can see all of the uh, messages that have changed since the last time they were connected. There's also a newer model called conflict-free conflict replicated data types. This is designed for more peer-to-peer -peer scenario where you may not necessarily have a central server. Um, and there are kind of two forms. There's an operations-based form where you say like, oh, I you know, added some number. But um, for this to work correctly, all of the operations must be commutative so that they can be applied in any order. Because you have no central system to say, this is the order they should be in. Uh, so you sort of have to figure it out. There's also uh, a state-based approach, which you can use. But the challenge here is that requires you sending the whole state, which from the earlier talk, we know that this can be quite unwieldy. They can be really big. So we don't want to have to reconcile thousands of blocks. What we really want to be able to do is keep the deltas very, very small. So those are the two types that you can use for collaboration. But there are also different kind of network architectures that you can consider. So the first is uh, central server with long polling. There's WebSockets. And then there's uh, WebRTC, which is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So in the long poly scenario, you have a central server again. Um, your clients will connect up to it. At one point, you'll have a client send some data. And then maybe the second client sends data. Um, now you say, OK, well, I've got some, some message. So you're OK, client two. I got you first, so you win. 
Um, by the way, client one, there was this other change in the meantime, so you have to do this transformation to your current state to get to the new state. Um, meanwhile, in HTTP, we've closed the previous connection, so we're going to open a new connection. Uh, and then this kind of happens ad infinitum until everyone disconnects. So uh, this is kind of how a lot of systems work. And it's relatively robust because you just, if you lose the connection, you reopen the connection. Um, then you get any updates in the meantime. WebSockets takes this a little bit further. So people realized, well, it's really complicated and really badly thought out in a way that you would want to do it this way because each handshake is going to take a bunch of operations over the network. It's going to be slow, especially in high latency environments. So uh, what if we could open an HTTP connection and just send messages back and forth without, without ever closing it? Um, and so it's nice because you can always fall back to the old model since it's still all over HTTP, but it allows you to do these bidirectional datagrams. Um, the problem, of course, is that it's not always supported. So particularly in our environment where we're looking at education, schools run proxies and all sorts of things that interfere with network traffic. Um, in fact, I was explaining to someone earlier, I tried this on the United flight on my way here, and it they have a proxy and it blocks the WebSocket. So, uh, but App Inventor fell back to using the long polling, so it was all good. Still high latency though. And then uh, lastly, there's the peer-to-peer -peer model, which uh, if you don't, or you're not familiar with WebRTC, uh, the idea is that it allows you to do NAT traversal between clients if it's possible. So basically we enumerate all of our IP addresses and all of the connection points we might be able to share information at. Um, and then we negotiate kind of where we're gonna connect. Um, it also has this mechanism called the turn server. So as a worst case scenario, you plop the server somewhere out in the world. And then um, if we can't agree anywhere that we're gonna make a connection, we route all of our traffic to the turn server uh, and it becomes a centralized model at that point. Um, we do this already. So if you've ever used App Inventor, you know we have this companion app where you can test out your application in real time as you're building it. And our connection model uses WebRTC to negotiate a peer-to-peer -peer connection between the browser and the phone. Um, and if it fails, it falls back to routing the connection through MIT. So some examples you might see of this, I think Google Hangouts uses it to do real-time video and audio chat. There are many different Google products now that do this. So let's talk about the Blockly event model. So those are all the ways we can connect to each other. How do we actually, what's the information look like that we want to share? So uh, if you've ever looked at this in your browser, in your uh, developer tools, you'll see it kind of looks like this. Uh, you get these small JSON payloads like at the top right. This is a block creation event. It will have a block ID associated with it, the group that the event belongs to the actual block XML so that you can create it, and then a list of IDs of blocks that it affects. And there are different representations for the different types of events. Um, the other nice thing about it is that, that it does these forward and backward methods. So um, for the transforms, you can actually unplay something and then replay it, sort of like a rebase if you're familiar with Git. Um, and everything has a unique ID and a pretty large value space. So uh, it's unlikely that you'll run into collisions. And then what we do in App Inventor is we wrap this in an additional set of metadata where we have a channel, which is basically a project ID with a screen name to uniquely identify the workspace, uh, the source of the event. So we either have designer, which is the where you lay out your app, or the blocks, which is the Blockly workspace, the user who generated the event, in which case it's me, and then the actual event payload, which is the thing at the top. We decided to use operational transforms for our approach. One, because we already have a central server where we store App Inventor projects, so it didn't make sense to use a peer-to-peer -peer model when we have a central server. Um, and we wanted to try to keep the number of connections down, so we went with WebSockets, but we're using Socket.io, which if you're familiar with it, has a fallback mechanism if WebSockets don't work to using a long pong technique, which is very nice. And we use Redis for queuing changes to event uh, the, the project and for uh, PubSub protocol. So 
we had three different modes we implemented actually. So the first was a pair programming approach where you just had a button where you could lock out the other person to take control of the workspace. Um, we had this component in block stack locking, which is shown in the top right there. So if I selected a set of blocks on your screen, you get this like hash mark thing, kind of like a disabled blockly block, but it was colored red or whatever color the person happened to be to indicate the selection. Uh, and then there was the real time mode where you could do anything. So even if I was in the middle of editing a block, you could move it out from under me. Um, and selection was indicated by changing the block highlight, uh, which you see in the bottom right there. And then we had 20 participants come in and actually test these different modes uh, to try to get a sense of how they worked with each of them. And by the way, you get this very nice event stream. So if you're into research or just want to understand how people are using the system, you get all these very nice JSON objects uh, showing each individual operation in the system. Uh, and so we wrote a whole bunch of different scripts and things to analyze how people were connecting blocks and tried to come up with ways of representing uh, collaboration within the environment. So our findings very quickly, just because I'm running out of time. Uh, users, when they were using the real-time system, really felt like they had a lot of control, although there was a slight preference to the locking condition where the whole stack got locked, so people couldn't come in and randomly pull blocks out. Uh, but overall, they liked it better than the pair programming approach. Uh, the real-time collaboration was the fastest mode for completing tasks, because without any locking, it was very easy for people to just come in and do whatever they needed to do in order to finish. Um, and overall, people showed the most appreciation for the real-time mode. Uh, but it's a small sample, so we're not sure that that's going to carry over. So we have developed the system. And if you want, I'm going to be letting people play with it during the demo session. Uh, so feel free to come by and talk to me. Um, I thought about doing it on the computer, but it's much cooler to have two people doing it separately instead of me just doing both things up here. Um, so please come by and try it out. Um, you know, We tested the three models. I'm only going to show the real-time collaboration one. Um, and if you have any questions as well about it, feel free to email me. That's my email up there. Uh, the master student thesis, where she did all the work to implement this, uh, is available at that URL. Uh, and um, I'll take any questions at this point, or we can move on to the next talk. Yes, Noah. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the question was, have we considered using a Git type model for making pull requests to a workspace? Uh, we discussed at the very beginning what we were going to do, um, whether we wanted to do the Google Docs approach or a Git-like model. Uh, we ultimately decided for the real-time approach mainly because we weren't sure that it would be ideal to try to teach middle schoolers how to do Git conflict resolution. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it, it's possible that we could still do something like that, um, but it's not been the primary goal for this work. Um, you know, we'd have to think about what the appropriate way is to visualize deltas and things like that and how to show them, especially if there are conflicts. So, um, but it's, I would say it's still an open area of research if people want to work on something like that. Yes. I think Neil might be better to answer that than I, <laughs> or maybe it's secret Google sauce that we're not allowed to know. <laughs> it will break if you're offline, yes. So one of the things that we're trying to work on is how to handle those types of things. And the easiest thing is we do have a, a read-only mechanism in App Inventor as well. Um, so one simple thing that we could do is if we do just, you know, if you get disconnected, we can put you into read-only mode temporarily until you regain connection. Um, but yeah, we don't have a way of, the, the CRGT model, which the second model I talked about is much better for handling that because in theory you can do the operations in any order. Um, so it's more robust to dealing with disconnects, but uh, we don't have a good solution for that right now.
Any other questions or? Right. Yeah. So, right. So in the earliest prototype, we basically let conflicts happen. And because the two people are sitting right next to each other, if such a thing happened, we could get them out of it. But more generally, our plan is to just try to make sure that we do the least destructive thing possible, mainly because at the moment we don't support undoing other users' operations. So if you do something destructive, I can't undo it. Therefore, it's, we want to prefer to do the least destructive thing because, you know, Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, because well, because it's mainly a timing issue. So the result, if you do, it, you have to set it up correctly. So the the easiest way to generate it is if you have two people sit right next to each other and do the thing at the same time. But um, it, you just end up with inconsistent workspaces, unfortunately, right now. So, um, but we're working on generating the set of OT rules we would need in order to resolve the conflicts. Um, failing to synchronize is probably not the right way to put it. It's, uh, it fails to come to a consensus is really what it is because what ends up happening is user A has the operations in one order, user B has the operations in another order, and so things just end up not being the same. Um, the server, though, has a state, which is the state that is correct based on the order that the server saw them in. Um, but one user will not be correct, and so the only way for them to get out of it really is to refresh. But we're working on solving that problem. Um, if you refer, well, the server has still seen the event, so it's still the work will still be there. Um, it just may not be necessarily what you intended because, depending on other events the server has received, um, like you say, I move, you move a block, and you move, and I move a block inside of your block, right? Did you really intend to just move your block, or did you intend to move the pair of blocks? Um, that will be basically up to the server to have figured out. So, okay, uh, Eric, I'll. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Oh, that, yeah, so the question was, is there too much information or too little information, or I guess neither is an option, in the event model as designed? Um, I think it's a more complicated question. I can answer it offline, but the short answer is, for the most part, it's worked well for us. Um, there might be slightly more, depending on, uh, like in the create event, if you've got a lot of um, XML, for example, that's probably way heavier weight than additional JSON just because XML versus JSON, right? <laughs> but um, but for the most part, it's worked pretty well. I mean, most of the messages are only like a couple hundred bytes each. So it's still sort of fitting into a single TCP packet. It's not too bad.